Hey, everybody. Welcome to our webinar today. My name is Julia Billen. I am the CEO, president, and owner of Warmly Yours. That's a lot of titles. That's a title, title, title. I need to retire, I think. I think you've accumulated <laughs> enough titles. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, the lovely Scott uh, next to me. He's in charge of everything technical. We keep it brief for you. Yeah, it's because I'm simple that way. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Cool. And we're going to be answering common questions about heated driveways, our snow melting systems, and questions we get uh, a lot through um, YouTube, social media, um, customers just calling in, wanting to know more about heated driveways. So ask your questions. We've got some in advance. You've got an expert here. Uh, and we'll make sure that everything uh, gets answered before we end today. All right, so let's talk about, in general, heated driveways, what they are, why we do this, hmm. uh, how we do it. Great so idea. Let's start right it's there. Like it's almost written for us to talk <laughs> about that. Well, heated driveways are great because they save you a lot of time and a lot of effort. So that's the idea here is it saves you time shoveling. Um, these systems need to be embedded. That's so, a key thing. Yeah. A lot of people think you can just kind of roll this out onto mm -hmm. an existing driveway or walkway or, or porch, but they really are embedded. So it's happening at the time that you're doing a major revision there to your driveway system. Right. And that's part of the deal. When you're doing your driveway, you have to think about removing the old driveway and then putting a new the new layers in too. So um, it's best to be putting it in at this point because you don't want to miss your, your miss your chance to get this great feature. And then we'll also be talking about different ways you can kind of configure your snow melting system. So we'll be talking about full coverage versus just something like tire tracks. Right. Um, so let's introduce the product line first. So, you know, what is the physical element that's being put into the driveway walkway or whatever outdoor surface? Right. Now, we really should have done this on St. Patrick's Day because of these beautiful green cables and mats. They are lovely. And if you look, the cable and the mats contain the same cable. It's just that on the mats, they're already pre-attached at the right spacing to give you really good m melting. Uh, otherwise, the cable is a little less expensive. But it's a little more labor intensive to put it uh, under your under your um, your walkway or your driveway or something like that. And later, I know you have some preferences when and how these two are used, and we'll be talking mm -hmm. about that later in the presentation. Um, but it's also important to know that you have a heating element, but then you also need to somehow control that. And so there's a variety of controls out there depending on how simple uh, you want the control or how complex. Um, why don't we just go through these six different models and maybe you can just give us a blurb on each and, you know, when, what, when you think it's the, which one you think is the best for certain applications. Well, we take a look at the top are the most automatic and the bottom are the least automatic, okay. uh, kind of, kind of. But if we take a look, if you have the premium controller, that's really good for asphalt because it has an over temperature sensor that goes actually in the asphalt to make sure that it doesn't overheat and melt the asphalt. The advanced is the same uh, type of control. It uses the same sensors as the premium. However, it doesn't have that over temperature sensor, so it's okay to use for pavers and for concrete. Nice. If you have really large space that you want to heat, but you don't have enough power to do it, you can break that space into zones, and the power modulator will allow you to heat one section, turn off, heat another section, turn off. So it's never switching too much power, causing your circuit breakers to blow. So a little more energy efficient there. And then you have economy, timer, the, and value. Yep, the economy is, uses a slab sensor. So if you're looking for a slab sensor, that's going to be your economy controller. Mm -hmm. It'll also allow you to do a snow melt and also a roof and gutter at the same time. It has two separate zones that you can do for that. Um, if you are somebody who is at home all the time and you know it's like, hey, I know when the snow is coming, I'm going to turn my system on. You have a timer control there, and you can just set it for however many hours you want it. If it's not quite melted, you can turn the timer again and start it up again. Easy. So those are really good for people that are at home all the time. Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe they work from home, maybe they're retired, that sort of stuff, because they're much less expensive mm -hmm. uh, control to do that. And then the value control is actually a control and a sensor all built into one. And if you have a really small installation under 16 amps, you can actually use the value controller there to sense the snow, sense the temperature, and then turn the uh, mats on and off mm -hmm. by itself. 
without so, any other needed electrical parts. Yeah, so it's kind of easy with the heating element. You have you have two things. It's either cable or cable unmesh, mm -hmm. uh, which helps you to control spacing. But for the controls, you really do have to kind of put a little bit more thought into it. Uh, think about how you're going to be using the system. To, uh, talk to your to your your customer and and go through the options and kind of try to fit it best to their lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Uh, and in terms of, you know, the complexity that they're interested in. Right. Some of it is application specific as well. Mm -hmm. So like you said, if you're doing asphalt, you might want the premium. If you're doing pavers, concrete, you may want to go with the advanced. If you have larger zones, you're going to be looking at that power modulator. Now, that power modulator, would it be used in conjunction with the premium, uh, for no. example? So no, it's that's just, its, it's, own just on its, it's on its own. So it can do different zones and turn them on. Um, the key to that is when you don't have enough power, you can't have two zones go on at the same time mm -hmm. because it could blow your circuit breaker. So this turns one section on, then it turns it off, then immediately turns on the other section. So you never have, like if you have 40 amps on each one, it never turns them both on, so all of a sudden you have 80 amps. Right. You have 40 amps, off, 40 amps, off, and it just rotates like that. So that's a great solution if you just don't have enough amps to fire it all at once. Correct. All right. Great. Thanks for going over that, Scott. Mm -hmm. Now let's talk about some of the uh, questions that we get most frequently. And we, we wanted to talk about controls first because it leads us into one of the most common questions that we get beyond how much does it cost to purchase and how much does it cost to operate. The first thing that people start to think is, well, gosh, you have to leave that on all the time, all winter long. Uh, that's going to be quite a hog in terms of electrical usage. But talk us through the reality of that. Well, this is the reality of why you don't put a snow melting system on a simple switch. Mm. Because if you turn a switch on and you melt the snow, and if you don't remember to turn that switch off, then you've got your system running all winter long. Yeah. And that can be really expensive. Right. So what's what this is, is the automatic controls won't turn the system on unless it's below a certain temperature and there's moisture present. So that's a sensor of, of sorts. Right, there's two, There's uh, usually the aerial sensor has both of those uh, sensors in it. Mm -hmm. So it senses if there's water falling or rain or snow, and then the, there's a sensor in the bottom, which is the ambient air temperature, and it will say, okay, well, it's raining or it's snowing, but it's only 40 degrees. Well, we know it's not going to build up and it's going to melt on its own, so there's no right. reason to turn the system on. But when it gets down below 38 degrees, we know that it's probably on the way down. Right. So it's going to kick in and it's going to start melting at that point. Now, the thing to keep in mind is even though you have an automatic system, there's still a switch where you can manually turn it on or off. So you're not at the you're not at the whim of this machine. It can go crazy on you. You just turn it on if you want it to start early mm -hmm. or turn it off if it's already melted and it's still running. So the thing about system runtime is um, the system runtime actually keeps the system on after the snow stops. That's what I was wondering. Yeah, how, yeah. And in general, how many hours before, after would you say that the systems are turning on and turning off? Well, you, that's uh, it's it's something you can set on a few of these, mm -hmm. anywhere between six hours or four hours to eight hours or 10 hours, mm -hmm. because the system needs to come on when it starts to snow. But when there's really a heavy snow event, it needs to stay on after the snow to melt what's there. Okay. Because if you don't, you just melt the, uh, the snow into water, then it refreezes again, or you may not melt it all the way. So this system will actually, after it stops snowing, it'll then continue to run for however many hours you need to do. And everybody's situation is different. You may right. have really, you know, you may live uh, somewhere where it, it, it only needs to be on for two hours. Or you may live someplace where consistently it takes to be a, a time of six to eight hours. Right. And I think that's why we have so many controls, because you need uh, those options available to you. Right. All right. So this is a, a common thing, that the question that we get. Uh, what about ice buildup? Uh, you talked a little bit about this. Mm -hmm. The hold on feature is that after runtime. Right. And that's what gets rid of that, because as it snows, what's going to happen is the snow, once again, is melting, but we're keeping the system on because what happens is we're going to make that water evaporate. Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure that you get that evaporation going. 
and that's going to get the water into the atmosphere, and you won't have ice buildup because it's all going to be in the air. Yeah, because ice can be even more dangerous than snow. Right, um, right. And so it's, that is key, that we understand that not only do they melt the snow, but they, they stay on to the degree that they'll melt the ice after as well. So you have a completely um, dry area. So mm -hmm. if you have kids come out there and shovel, they're going to shovel, but there's always going to be snow or ice impacted into that gravel, or not gravel, but into the top of your concrete or into the top of your asphalt. So when you go out there and you look at it, you still see snow. It's just pushed down into the top layer. So what this does, it completely gets rid of that. So we did have a question um, in about this. Uh, we're going to talk about it in this slide. And what's the minimum degree of roll off necessarily to uh, necessary to ensure no standing water after melting? Yeah, well, that's first of all, a question we're going by to, Claudette. Yep, Claudette, thank you for that question. And first of all, we're going to be getting rid of that because it's going to evaporate. But if you uh, do any research online, you'll see that most paving companies rep, uh, require or suggest a 2% drop, which is about a quarter inch per foot. So you're going to have a slight crown this way, or it's going to be uh, uh, directing water away from the house. Mm -hmm. So you always want to try to get the water off the system and into somewhere to drain or to get it off into the yard away from the house. So you'll see that. You'll either see it tilted or you'll see a 2% crown, as Great. they call it. I hope that answers your question, Claudette. I see you're with us today. So let's go on to the next one because I think we have a good idea now of how we can get rid of that ice buildup. Yeah, because so let's talk about that extreme conditions. We're in Illinois. We do get some pretty extreme conditions It here. snows all the time here. <laughs> it certainly feels yeah. like that. <laughs> So, um, so our, our snow melting systems that, that you were just talking about, they melt about one to two inches on average per hour. Um, what, what are some of the conditions that can occur that might diminish um, how effective the system might be, just so that we set the right expectation? Well, usually you get snow in the 20, 20 to 32 degree range, somewhere in there. Uh, what the problem is with any system out there for consumer for the consumer market mm -hmm. is the consumer market. We know that the consumers only have a certain amount of electricity. So you can't make this 300 watt per square foot system because they'd only be able to hit a, a heat about 20 square feet and then they run out of power. Okay. So what we do is we design at 50 watts per square foot. We're gonna be talking about this a little bit later. But what happens is if it snows and then you have a cold snap come in directly behind that where the temperatures plunge down into the single digits, that's going to take some while to, to actually melt that because we only have so many BTUs from that 50 watts per square foot. Mm -hmm. And we have to remember all those BTUs are going whoop, straight up. It's complete right. total heat loss. That's right. So that's where you're going to have really gigantic amounts of snow mm -hmm. or a good snow event with plunging temperatures where it gets really, really cold. Mm -hmm. Those are going to be sometimes trouble and they're going to take sometimes longer to turn to, to melt. And that's why you can even turn your automatic system on manually because you can say, hey, there's still a little bit left. I'm going to press the button and we're going to make it heat again. So important to set those expectations. Right. Okay. And now you talked about this, you know, we get that all the time. Uh, why don't I just, uh, you know, pace, you know, why don't I just get out there and shovel? And, and um, you know, there are some reasons why that may not be the best way to, to handle it. I mean, one is you shovel and it's sort of continuing to come down. Correct. Right. So, you know, you're really uh, temp only temporarily getting rid of that snow. Um, what might be some other reasons not to shovel? Well, why why shovel if you don't have to? I mean, if you want to get <laughs> exercise, just go out and walk on the street. You know, if there's any, if, if there's not too much snow on it, yeah, you don't go, go out go for a walk. Don't go out where it's freezing cold and slippery. Right. And the thing is, it eliminates the health and safety hazards associated with snow removal. I right. Mean, a lot of bad things can happen to people when they're out shoveling snow. Overexertion. Yeah, exactly. Slipping, just as we talked about earlier. We talked so, about we talked about earlier, too, is you're going to go out there and shovel, and you're going to shovel, and you're still going to have a layer of ice. Right. Or you're going to have that compacted snow in there mm -hmm. that you're not going to be able to get rid of. Yeah. So that's, I mean, why not? Physical exertion, and you're really not getting rid of all the snow anyway. Right. Excellent. And that this, this is another common question. Um, Let's look at, uh, oh, okay, so we do have a question from Charles. Is there a difference in effectiveness between concrete or asphalt? They're both very good conductors. Yeah. Um, concrete is a little more dense, so it's going to heat a little bit better because no matter how much you smash asphalt, it's still got little pockets of air in it. 
So you're going to see more uh, a rapid, um, it, it's going to be negligible. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's going to be very negligible, but you'd have to set up a science experiment to see that the concrete actually is going to heat a little bit faster. But that uh, asphalt does tend to soak up the, the no, radiant oh, sure. heating That's coming, I said. coming off the sun. So. The differences are minute. I, but I, I would vote for asphalt mm -hmm. slightly over uh, concrete okay. chills. No, thanks for the question. Mm -hmm. Great question. Um, and then, you know, the the other thing is what about just using salt? We see those salt bags at your uh, local big box store uh, every season um, and um, fairly inexpensive. Uh, so why not salt, Scott? Well, because you, if you ever walk down someone's driveway in the spring and you see someone who's been using a lot of salt on their driveway, usually all the plants around that driveway are dead mm. because that salt is going to get in there and it's going to kill the, the plants a, a lot of times. If you ever drive down a street where they use a lot of salt, You'll see where they actually put burlap bags around trees and that sort of stuff. Yeah, I have seen that. Yep, that's to keep the salt off of those trees and off of that foliage because it will damage them. And a lot of times if you drive down the street in the spring and you'll see a nice green um, shrub that's green from about four feet up, but mm -hmm. it's dead from about four feet down, that got a little too close to the salt. So, oh, okay. you know, you can run into problems with that. And also you don't want your pets out there um, to, to be uh, absorbing any of that. So... You know, and it's also bad for cars. I, mean, I know you're a big car guy. So. And, and the last thing I want to be doing is driving over a salt-covered driveway. Yeah. So it just makes sense. Okay. So uh, good for the, uh, it's bad for the environment, mm -hmm. bad for your uh, toys, the, right. the cars, and, and not so great for humans and, and pets either. And so. foliage. So that's, I mean, there's a lot yeah. of reasons not to use salt. Okay. So, um, so those are some of the common questions, uh, you know, that, that we get. We also uh, will be talking a lot about uh, how much this costs to operate, uh, how much it costs in general for the product. We'll be talking about that later in the presentation. But what we wanted to do now is kind of introduce you to the top three uh, applications for this product. So we're going to be talking about asphalt, we're going to be talking about um, pavers, and we're going to be talking about concrete and how those are installed pretty, you know, not too detailed. We're going to, we're going to be uh, short on it, but we did want to kind of review all of that with you. So let's talk, let's talk about asphalt. Great visual there. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I see that you're using the uh, roll cable on mesh product here. Is that the preferred product that you would use for an asphalt install? Yes. Did I just kind of like yep. put that right at your feet? Exactly. <laughs> you set them up and I'll knock them out of the park. There you go. So what you see here is you, you've got really three layers. Yeah. You've got compacted gravel. We're going to get into the cross section here. But the thing is to keep in mind is if you deal with asphalt uh, companies, they're going to, they're kind of moving towards the, I just want to do a three inch pour and mm -hmm. be done with it. Mm -hmm. uh, what you really need to do is you really need to do a two step pour here. And they're still used to doing that. It's just kind of, they're moving to a three inch because, oh, that's what we do now. But really they can still do it this way. Because of the electric floor warming, uh, not electric, uh, uh, electric snow melting product, mm -hmm. um, and to mitigate damage from that, to that, that is why you want to do the two-step. Is, is right. that? Exactly. Okay. So what you do here is you can actually see that we've used the machine to put the asphalt down mm -hmm. over the compacted gravel. And then we lay these mats out because these mats are laid out and you pull them a little bit and then you, then you pour asphalt over them. Then you unroll them a little bit. It's very difficult. You can't do that trying to string cable back and forth. So that second layer always needs to be done by hand. Yes. Okay. And you'll see that the guys are there shoveling it over by hand because if you take a machine over this, you're going to just start ripping everything up. So okay. this, the first uh, layer can be done by machine. Then the second layer, you can use a bobcat or something to drop the asphalt, but then right. it needs to be shoveled and raked into place. Fantastic. So this is the cross section that you were referring to. Re walk us through the layers. Where do you want to start? Top, bottom, bottom, always top? Stop at the bo always start at the bottom because cool. that's what we need to do. We need to figure out the, the compacted gravel is going to be kind of the, the uh, determined. Foundation. Yeah, and it's also going to determine the height of the, of the driveway in relationship to the area it's in. Okay. So what you want to do is you want to get the compacted gravel up high enough so it has drainage. You don't want to you put four inches of gravel in and all this and then have the driveway three inches below the surrounding dirt. Okay. So you definitely have to keep this in mind is how high do I want this? Because I know I'm going to have about four inches of asphalt. So I need to make sure that I have the right amount of compacted gravel underneath to get that whole sandwich the right height. 
So that's why we put here the compacted gravel from four to 12 inches, mm -hmm. because that's going to tell us how high the system is in relationship to a surrounding area. And then we're going to put the base coat of asphalt. And once we get that base coat of asphalt, we're going to be in a hurry because we want to get these rolls rolled out and covered with asphalt. Because as soon as that asphalt truck arrives at your address, that asphalt starts to cool. Yeah, and that asphalt, when you lay it, is pretty hot. Very hot. So um, how do we prevent this, the, the heating element from being damaged? The heating element has a special covering on it that mm -hmm. keeps it um, resistant to high temperatures. So it usually when you're getting this, it's around 300 degrees. Wow. Uh, this system is, is rated for a much higher temperature than that. Nice. So you don't have to worry about it melting. That's why you very rarely see asphalt done with hot water. Because you put hot water tubes in there, you put the asphalt on, it's 300 degrees, it just melts it. Yeah, so hydronic systems. Yeah, are, 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 are sometimes either not done at all or very difficult to do. Mm -hmm. So if you have asphalt, you should be thinking of electric. Okay. And this is the exact layering that you want to have it. So when you speak to your, uh, your asphalt people, tell them you want it done in two pores because we have a layer of electrical cable that goes in between. Perfect. All right. Thanks for walking us through that. Uh, so we wanted to kind of show you what a, uh, a plan would look like. We call this a smart plan. Reason being is it's smart to kind of understand the coverage for you or for your, your consumer in advance. So set the expectation. And through this, you can also kind of understand the electrical requirements. You know exactly where the heating element is. That's where the snow will melt. Anything else, you're not going to get any melting of snow. Mm -hmm. And the one thing we need to talk about on this plan is there's a lot of secret information that's kind of hidden, but it really isn't. You just have to look for it. And one of those things is we direct our, um, our eyes into the middle at the bottom, and you'll see what the product is, and you'll see what the wattage is, and you will see the breakers. It'll tell you how many breakers you need and what amperage they need to be. Also, if we take a look, we'll also tell you how much it costs to operate per hour, uh, what the total amperage of the system is, and what the total wattage is. So what it's going to do is this is going to allow you to give this plan to your electrician and the electrician is going to go, okay, we can do that, we can do that, we can do that, check, 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 and we're done. The next thing the electrician is going to want to look at is if we move our uh, little pointer there directly under the F in full coverage, you will see that there is a J there in a circle. Mm -hmm. That J is a junction box location. Okay. Because each one of these electrical heating cables has a 20 foot cold lead on it. Okay. Um, and it is also long, it's available for, for longer distances in 208 and 277 for commercial applications. Mm -hmm. But that J box is there because that's where the everything's going everything's to, going to lead right to lead there. right back to the junction box. So you can see why it's so beneficial instead of just going out there blindly and laying, oh I'm gonna lay this one here, right. lay this one there. Just follow the plan and that way you know exactly the electrical you need and where each one of these is going to go. And the J shows the electrician where he wants to put that junction box. Mm. And we do that free of charge. Um, a lot of companies uh, will charge you for that, but we believe that it's so important that we invest that time, we invest that energy so that everything is laid out in advance, no surprises. So let's take a look at a different kind of thinking here. And mm -hmm. the other, the first slide was, I want to heat the whole thing. Complete coverage. Yep. And we know that when you get into larger spaces, especially long driveways, that you can't heat every square inch unless you have your own nuclear plant on location. <laughs> you just may not have the power, the juice right. to do that. Right. So this allows you to get your car in and out of your driveway, but still make it so you can afford to do it and also so you can have enough electricity to do it. So what we're looking at is these two strips. These are tire tracks. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, worst case scenario, and I've had this happen to me in the winters, is you're trying to pull out of that driveway uh, can't quite do it. You're slipping and sliding everywhere. This is can't have full coverage, but this is a great solution for making sure you can get in and out of that driveway right. safely. Right. And this plan is exactly like the other plan. It, in the middle there at the bottom, mm -hmm. we see how many breakers we need, how many circuits we need. The operating cost is there on the right. The total amperage of the whole job is there on the right. Mm -hmm. So all this information, you're just going to get this plan. You're going to give one to your asphalt guy and one to your electrician yep. and go, Here's here we go. And this is the information they're going to need to go ahead and get your system done. And the visual that we saw uh, in the beginning where we were talking about asphalt install, those two rolls, that was a tire mm -hmm. track. Uh, install. Exactly. So if you if you want to save on energy, you want to save on budget, this is a great solution. Right. 
okay. especially especially with power too, if you don't have enough power to do that whole coverage. Here you can see, this is a concrete install, but this mm -hmm. is full coverage here. Mm -hmm. Those cables are three inches, spaced three inches apart from one another, and we're heating every square inch of it. Well, we can because it's a smaller area. Now I notice you're using the cable product here mm -hmm. and not cable on mesh. Is there a reason why? Uh, because it helps you, uh, we, we suggest that you use cable in stairs okay. because it's easier to string individual strings of wire as opposed to working with that on the mesh. Mm -hmm. It's uh, less expensive, but it's also a little more uh, time consuming to install. So stairs, you would recommend it. What about ramps? Ramps, yeah, uh, ramps you can do either one, okay. um, but the, the cable is much more forgiving for like curved areas or irregularly that aren't rectangular type spaces you want to heat. Um, if you have anything that isn't a rectangle, you probably want to go to cable or a mixture of mats and cables. I see. That's true. Why yeah. couldn't you? You could exactly. just mix it. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we designed that for you so we could give the best solution, whether it's and, cable, roll on mesh, or some type of mix of the, of the two. Yeah. So usually if you have a stairs, a set of stairs and a walkway, mm -hmm. you'll do the stairs in cable because it's easy to string it back and forth. And then the walkway will be done in mats. Okay. And then I see you're saying that the, the system should be embedded two to three inches uh, beneath the, uh, the surface. Anything else for concrete that you have to pay attention with? Well, we're going to talk about that in just a second. But okay. when you're talking about concrete install, the one thing to keep in mind is if you're using the mats, mm -hmm. the mats have little squares in them. Um, the mesh has openings that are an inch and a quarter uh, squares in each, you know, and the reason why that mesh is inch and a quarter is is you take the uh, the cable or the mat, you put it halfway up, you prop it up before, and then you pour the concrete and it goes right through. So you don't have to pour a layer of concrete, lay the mats on top and pour another layer. Okay, I you see. You just put it into place and pour the concrete and it goes through all that. So you can see this hmm. concrete is actually just going to flow through the cables, but it will do the same thing. With mats, you do have to make sure that you tell your concrete guy that he's going to use sub three quarter inch aggregate. Because if the aggregate's any bigger, it won't get through the holes. Now that's a lot of information, folks. So if, if that doesn't come across... Just give us a call. We've got the technical experts here uh, on the phones 24-7, mm -hmm. uh, and they can kind of walk you through your application and what would be the best way to do it. So let's take a look at this drawing right here because what we have is we have compacted gravel. That's mm -hmm. a common theme for everything. Right. And then we have concrete blocks. Okay, so that's what you were talking about. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, so this picture is, is perfect. Then. Yeah. And the concrete blocks can, can be like blocks you go out and buy, or it can be debris left over from the construction site. Mm -hmm. Anything that's going to allow you to prop it up. To elevate it. Yeah, and then also concrete supply stores also sell chairs. They call them chairs or top hats. And all they are is just little pieces of metal that are designed to put the rebar into the middle of the pour. So what we're doing here is instead of just putting this cable on these rebar or metal frame and just having it sit Directly. Directly on, on the ground. Yeah. We want to get them up into the middle of the pour so the concrete goes through it. Okay. Because and the, then it's encased, if right, you will. Right, right. And okay. the further the cable is from the top of the surface, the longer it's going to take to heat or it may not, you know, if you get it really far away, it may not melt at all. Yeah. So you really want to get it within that two to three inches? Mm -hmm. yep. Okay. So usually you're going to have a four inch concrete slab. Mm -hmm. What we're doing in essence is we're using something to prop the rebar and the cable up into the middle of the pour. And that makes it more energy efficient yep. and it, it, it doesn't it's take faster. as long. Yep. Okay, got it. All right, and finally, pavers. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about that. I see here you've got the uh, roll on mesh product here, the cable on mesh product. Could be done either way or do you always prefer this method? Well, this looks great. I mean, the thing yeah, you have to keep in mind with pavers is if you're going to heat a pavered area, we really didn't talk about it on the slide, but if you're doing a heated area with pavers, you want to heat all of it because you want to try to stay away from tire tracks and pavers because what happens is after it freezes and thaws, it can kind of rut on you. Okay. So you don't want some ruts in there where the two heated sections are, so they may over time rut out. And that might actually mean it takes longer for certain areas mm -hmm. to, to even warm up. So right. pavers always suggest full coverage. Correct. Or could you, uh, well, I guess, you know, I'm thinking even if you did half of a paver, paver section, you still might get that, uh, that rutting, I would assume. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing is, you want to make sure that the pavers aren't too thick, too. Mm -hmm. You want to make sure that your pavers are uh, two and a half inches or less. Yeah. Um, and also, 
what happens is is you're laying this this mat out onto compacted gravel or compacted sand, however the installation is being done. The thing is, when this is done, the, the ideal way to do it, we're going to talk about it here. And actually, why don't we just go? You want to go this. right to it? Yeah. And if we take a look at this, you can see from the bottom up. Remember, we always look from the bottom up because okay. we're making layers. So we've got the crushed gravel that is going to, is common for everything. Mm -hmm. Then we have the rebar or metal frame. You don't have to worry about propping it up because what's going to happen is in the, in a perfect world, you're going to put finished mortar. Okay. You're just going to throw mortar over the top of that to an inch to an inch and a half. A lot of people don't want that expense of doing mortar. So they'll do an inch to an inch and a half of sand or stone dust. Mm -hmm. So uh, we kind of put them in the order that you want to try to do it. If you can use mortar, that's going to transfer heat the best. Yeah. And I see that this is a little bit closer to the surface than concrete. Mm -hmm. Yep. And the thing is, because you got a couple layers that you have to get through. Yeah. So if you want to, you want to make sure, well, you know, if you take a look at this, the pavers we, we talked about are maximum two and a half inches thick. Mm -hmm. So what we have here is we want the mortar because it's going to uh, pass the heat up to those pavers. Yes. Um, what we kind of left off here is we we left off the layer between the pavers and the mortar just to keep it clear because we know that when people are laying these pavers down they're going to put sand kind of like of a layer between the mortar and the pavers. I see. So if we go back here, we talk about this last bullet point. When using sand, make sure that you just don't go in there and go, okay, here's one, here's one, here's one, and drop it because if that th if that uh, sand is too thin and if you drop it at an angle that paver can go right into the cable and damage it in really bad and situations. Just be aware that the heating element is there and you've got to protect it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you've, you've got here the, the pavers, the mortar, sand, and stone dust. That's that intermediate, uh, intermediate layer there. Mm -hmm. So you kind of get an idea here. The secret to this that we found over the years is just make sure that you keep the wire about three inches from the top surface. That's what you want to try to do. Nice. So this sometimes leaves you about three and a half inches, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. But uh, pavers, this is kind of what you want to do. And this is a lot of people are doing these now. Nice. So asphalt, you would say, is the most popular, and then pavers, and then concrete? I, what are you seeing out there? Uh, concrete is usually second just because of the cost. I see. You know, co uh, concrete's pretty expensive. So um, but pavers it's the are pretty best. expensive? Or? Pa it depends. A paver driveway is really expensive. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. So, yeah. So, pavers are usually like patio areas and that sort of stuff. It I tends see. to be a price, a good price point for that. But when you're doing a paver driveway, that's when you're going to be running into, because remember, we want to do that paver driveway complete coverage. Right. So, that's a large areas that are done with pavers isn't usually the best. You want to try to go uh, concrete or, or um, asphalt. asphalt. Yeah. Good to know. All right, we get this a lot. This is probably the most popular uh, question uh, because people are uh, just assume it's electrical. Um, it is a bit, you know, it's 50 watts per square foot, so it certainly um, uh, is a little bit uh, energy intensive. Mm -hmm. But um, when you look at how how long it's on, how long it's off, um, and you look at electrical costs uh, and the average kind of coverage. It doesn't. Uh, it, it doesn't look so so bad. Uh, and so we really like to show these charts so that people understand that per hour or even per winter, depending on where you're living, because electrical kilowatts, uh, the kilowatt cost is different per per geo geo area. Mm -hmm. That it's not so bad from New York to Denver uh, per hour. Tire tracks we we were showing you per hour full coverage. So in New York, it's 60 cents for the tire tracks, so roughly $50, $50 for the winter, uh, but full coverage, uh, $1.50, roughly 123 And what we base that on is the average size driveway. We get a lot of plans in, so we kind of know what's the average size driveway that people mm -hmm. are, are melting, and that's roughly uh, 20, 20 foot long, 10 feet wide. Um, and again, you're, we're not always doing full coverage. We're, we're also doing a lot of those tire tracks. Mm -hmm. And um, we had a question from Jonathan, and Jonathan asked us ahead of time, and um, he kind of asked how, how many amps per square foot is it? Mm -hmm. um, we don't really think about amps per square foot because we're really thinking 50 watts per square foot. Right. So if you did um, 50 watts per square foot in 120 volts, that would be about a half an amp. Okay. okay. Per square and foot. Per square foot. And if you did it in 240, it'd be like a quarter of an amp. Okay. So, I mean, but we don't normally don't think in that small of terms right. because when you're thinking about a really long driveway or something, you're not thinking of one square foot of well, how much is that little bit going to cost me? Yeah. So, but that's still a good question though, Jonathan. I think 
this slide here exactly shows you what the answer to your question. It helps also because you know you can see for tire tracks you're usually looking at about 80 square square feet uh, for full coverage. You're usually looking at about 200 square feet. So these are good numbers to kind of know um, if someone's kind of asking you for pricing. You can kind of give a a good feel very quickly for what that might cost in terms of energy usage, and then we'll also talk about product costs as well. Right. And we did have a question we kind of gloss over. We got so enraptured with this presentation <laughs> that uh, we had a question from Mike, and he said, do you have a system for existing concrete driveways? Okay. Um, existing concrete driveways are, um, every anything is possible if you have enough money and if you have enough time. Right. Uh, when you're dealing with a retrofit, you're not only dealing with buying cables, because you have to do it with cables. You can't do it with mats. And to use that cable, you have to have pay some guy to come out and cut concrete, yeah. which is very, very expensive. And then that guy's got to cut concrete uh, cuts every three inches, three inches apart, your entire driveway or whatever area you're going to heat. And then you have to kind of fill it in and make it look like it's yeah. all... Mm -hmm. the same and it, it's it's usually not going to look the same yeah and it's usually um it, usually the labor is just uh, atrocious in that type of job it can be done we sold a couple of them mm -hmm. but um i can tell you that 99 percent of the people are going to put this in when they're replacing the driveway or making a new driveway good all right so operating costs not so bad mm -hmm. um uh, and then the product cost itself uh, and this is based on uh, the average, um, I think, is this a tire track or full coverage? This one's tire track. Tire track. So average co cost here was about a little over 2K. And that mm -hmm. is, in my experience, uh, we're usually when I'm looking at these quotes, they usually range somewhere between, I'm going to say on average, uh, I, I, about 3,000. Okay. Uh, and, you know, they can go up to be much more if the, the coverage is larger. But average driveway is going to come in for tire tracks right about that 2.5, 3K range. So as you can see, the operating cost is not that high. Mm -hmm. The product cost is not that high. The real cost uh, is the fact that you're redoing your driveway. Right. So ideally, if you're going to go through the cost uh, and expense to redo the driveway, do it, get that snow melting in there at the same time. I think that's really the way to sell this. Right. Now, a lot of people, when they approach us, they've never done a project like this. We, we deal with a lot of uh, people that are researching this stuff on their own, yeah. looking for answers. And that's why we're here is to give answers and to give what we've learned, uh, give that information to you so you don't make mistakes mm -hmm. that some people have made that we've learned from them. And so every situation is slightly different. You got different type of install, different product, different, different type controls. of different type of controls. Most people always, I can tell you nine times out of ten, when somebody is approaching us for the first time, they'll go, "I've got a driveway and I want to heat it all." Okay. Well, th that would be full coverage. Okay. So Let's I see. just want to. I'm going to go back to the previous slide, but I want you to look in the lower right hand corner. Okay. Here's the full coverage price using a, pretty much the same stuff. Three thousand. Thirty one eighty one. If you do tire tracks, you've cut almost a thousand dollars off just mm -hmm. the product. Mm -hmm. So that's where we normally go when someone goes, "Oh, that's kind of expensive," or "I don't have enough power." That's where we go. Okay, instead of doing this full coverage, which is thirty-one eighty-one, we can heat the place where your tires are going to be going, save you a lot of money, mm -hmm. save you operating costs, and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So, so something's better than nothing. Right. Exactly. All right. Now, talk me through what is the snow melt plaque. The snowmelt plaque. I mean, is, it looks pretty. It's fantastic. It's like a bronzy <laughs> plaque. And what it is, is it's required by the National Electric Code. Is it requires you to mark a location that's got electric heating cables in it. Okay. So someone just doesn't come by and go T -t 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 with a jackhammer and go, oh, I'm going to fix this. No, you don't want to. That's this. That's what this is, is a marker. Okay. Got it. All right. So that uh, gives us some idea of operating costs, product costs. What do we want to talk about next? Oh, this is yours. You love this one. Yeah, we should just can this because we talk about this at every <laughs> webinar. Testing. But the, the thing is, you want to make sure this is a really big job, right? Yeah. It, and that you're dealing with a lot of different moving parts. You're dealing with expensive stuff. You're it dealing is. with yards and yards and yards of concrete mm -hmm. or hundreds of pavers. And installing that, the product cost costs money. The installation labor costs a lot of money. The last thing you want to do is put a cable in that's been damaged by the shipper. So you want to make sure it's good before you spend all this time and effort and money putting it into this 
concrete slab that it's going to be very difficult to get it out of if something's wrong with it. I've seen how some of those boxes arrive on site, and it is not pretty. So always right. test your snow melt systems. By the way, we test them before they leave the door exactly. uh, because we know how much money uh, goes into redoing your driveway um, or your sidewalk, whatever you're doing. Uh, we test everyone. Mm -hmm. we, we actually document uh, those numbers, uh, so we always have that for you. Uh, but when you get it, it's so important that you just take a few minutes, doesn't take a lot of time, and test that product. Make sure that it's still 100% functioning. You can uh, test the ohms. There's um, on the product itself, uh, there's actually a label that, that shows you the uh, ohm rating that you should, you should get once you're testing. And just, you know, make sure that that is 100%. Now, when, with this type of job, it's a really big job. And whenever you're dealing with big jobs that have a lot of electricity, we always suggest that this is done by an electrician. Because yeah, it's a really big job. Yeah, and the thing is, you can lay the cables out yourself. Yeah. You, can, you can do the layout. Sure. You can do all that yourself. Yeah. But when it comes down to attaching these systems to the mains, to the main system, you want to make sure an electrician does that for Absolutely. you because there's a lot of conduit, there's junction boxes, all that sort of stuff. So don't expect to do that part yourself unless you are a licensed electrician. Absolutely. And part of the reason I bring that up is because this product is really the only product we have that is required to use a mega ohm meter. Mm -hmm. And what a mega ohm meter does is it sends 5,000, I'm sorry, 500 volts or 1,000 volts down this wire to make sure that the insulation you can see there's three wires there. Right. There's insulation around each one of those wires. The red, the yellow, and the black. Mm -hmm. And what those do is they keep the wires from touching inside the cable. Well, if someone takes a jackhammer or someone takes a shovel and smashes those wires together, you could have a short. And what this mega ohm meter does, it tests to see if there's any power going from one to the other wire. Okay. And you can't do that with a normal voltmeter because they only have nine volts. This shoots 500 or 1,000 volts down this cable. So once again, that's a lot of voltage. And once again, that's something that you would want your licensed and bonded electrician to do. Excellent. Okay, so test. And mm -hmm. then if something does happen, all is not lost. Uh, one, you have an amazing tech support team here at Warm Lears. But beyond that, we also have the tools. Uh, we've been doing this for a number of years. And so we uh, kind of put together a, a tool set that helps to find uh, and then repair uh, any damage that's been done to the cable. Yeah, these tools are the same tools we use for troubleshooting indoor systems mm -hmm. because you just have to realize that outdoor heating systems are just kind of like floor systems on steroids. Pretty much. The cables are bigger. They have more watts per linear foot, more ohm, uh, different ohms per linear foot, that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. But you still use the same things to troubleshoot that. So the last thing you are going to expect is if something happens to one of your cables, you don't have to rip up your entire driveway to, to, to take it out and go, okay, I got to replace everything. Right. So let's get the guys out here, jackhammer it. You don't have to do that at all. You use these tools to find the exact spot where the problem is. So the thermo camera or yep. the cable fault finder, uh, they're going to find the exact uh, spot. And then um, we're going to repair, repair it. it. So here you can see this, and this is an asphalt job, and I actually did this one, and I took this picture. <laughs> and if we take a look at this, we're going to use the thermal camera and the tools we have to find out where this spot is. Okay. Well, once we find the spot, we just have to dig it up, and then we do our little repair on it. And here we can see that we've gone down into the layers here. We've, uh, you know, you get it hot. You can, you can excavate asphalt fairly easily mm -hmm. and you make your repair you make it waterproof using heat shrink tubes with the kits that we send you um, so you just find that bad spot cut it out put them back together again using the waterproof heat shrinks that we send along with the kit and then you use the heat shrink that's what that red stuff is to make the entire repair waterproof and I assume this is an electrician that's doing this repair is that correct yes Okay. Now you've done um, you've done repairs on asphalt. That looks pretty easy. But what about the uh, concrete? That seems like it'd be a little bit more difficult to hammer out that. Well, you it is. You have to just be careful, you know, because you're going to go in and you're going to break up that concrete. We're going mm -hmm. to have a video on that coming up uh, one of these days that we went out and shot where um, actually a shovel did hit one of the cables. We uh, jackhammered up that spot, reconnected it, mm -hmm. uh, poured concrete over it, and you can't even tell it's been repaired. Well. Okay. So good news is all is not lost. Right. Uh, so test. Uh, if something happens during uh, the install, uh, get in touch with us right away because better we, we uh, resolve it immediately than 
having the homeowner uh, call back uh, next season and say, why isn't my snow melting system uh, working? That's the right. worst time you want to kind of uh, deal with that. Exactly. And an electrician should be using the mega ohm meter as the installation is going along. So mm -hmm. he can say, okay, something just happened. And the guy with the shovel is going, it wasn't me. <laughs> and you can say, okay, well, just stop right there. Call us. Doesn't we'll, matter who it was. Yeah, we'll, we'll just fix it. Yeah. And we'll just tell you is take, uh, you can continue to do the paving if you want to mm -hmm. just dam off the area where the problem is so we can get at the wire and make the repair mm -hmm. and then cover it with, uh, with asphalt later. Nice. All right, let us know if you, ha you have any questions. Um, we're going to be uh, sending out this recording to you in a few days, uh, so you'll have that for reference. We'll also be sending uh, to you a, um, a video. We're going to attach that to the email. Uh, we have a video that's kind of gone viral, if you will. It's got about 44 million views between YouTube, Instagram, Facebook. Uh, and so um, a lot of people are interested in seeing um, how these products are installed and actually how they how they operate as well. Mm -hmm. So we'll be sending a video along with this. Um, if you have any questions, uh, we can just kind of, um, if you don't have them now, get in touch with us. Scott's available, anyone else on the technical team, uh, and myself personally. Uh, we want to continue talking about um, snow melting and, and de-icing. And so our next webinar is going to be focused on that as well. This is the time, guys, to really be thinking about installing these products when you actually can get uh, out and, and you can break the ground, you can get up on the roof. So our next webinar is going to be talking about roof and gutter de-icing. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll be back on May 10th. Uh, we hope you regulars will be joining us. Um, and then we also like to uh, talk about uh, the... I, I, I want to wait. I want to wait here because this this slide is really important because okay. you may not know that you have problems that need to be addressed with roof and gutter systems, but if you've gone out to your uh, into your front yard and you see big icicles hanging from your gutters, uh -huh. big icicles hanging from your roof, that sort of stuff, that That's is telling problem. you you have a problem because eventually what happens is water gets up under your shingles and then goes into your house. Don't ask me how I know. <laughs> um, just because I had a whole wall of my house taken down because right. water got in. Okay. So this is how you know if you need to join us next next month or not. If you have any stalactites or icicles hanging from your gutters, you might want to tune in. All right. And then we always like to tie in our monthly promotion. So we are, uh, for the next two months, we're going to be doing a promotion on all of our uh, de-icing and snow melting products. So 20% off. This is an interesting one because uh, we don't always discount controls. Uh, and this time we're, it's 20% off the heating element as well as the control. So if you can take advantage of that, please do. Mm -hmm. And then uh, give us your feedback. Tell us. I mean, uh, we picked the next webinar ourselves. We thought, de-icing, it's a nice time to talk about that. But we want to know what you want to learn about, what you want to know about, what's going to help you uh, decide to purchase or your, your homeowners to, to purchase this product. So give us that feedback. We'll be asking for it. Exactly. Okay. We don't have any other questions, but if you do, contact us. My email is there for a reason. I really want you to get in touch with me personally. Uh, you can see Scott's email is not there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because I get some of the ones that get addressed to her. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty much what happens. Give us a call. Not all uh, of them, just a couple. Just a call. Yeah. Like us on Facebook because uh, we like you. Um, anything else, Scott? No, check us out on Facebook, though, too. And we always have a lot of good um, content on our Facebook pages and all of our media, um, social media platforms. So um, if you ever just want to see what's going on here in the, in the ranch, yeah. feel free to, to You want to see us. cat photos and dog yeah, photos. Yeah, fantastic. All right, guys. Well, we love spending this time with you. So until next time, stay warm and be radiant. All right. Take care.